Good morning, everyone. We had a little different call to worship this morning as we have lots of music for our festival Sunday as we celebrate Reformation Sunday on the Sunday actually before Reformation as it comes in the middle of the week. Uh, welcome to everybody that here this morning. We're glad to have you here. As we celebrate our Lord and our Savior and the gospel that he has given us, uh, we're going to look at the Word of God today and actually follow up in the last chapter of Hebrews that we've been looking through in chapter 13. And my prayer for you is that today as we enter into the house of God that you might walk away with the, with the, with the confidence of, of the love of God who burns for us in our lives and that that might make a difference as we live our everyday lives for our Lord and our Savior. We're going to follow the order of service as you have it printed out for you in your bulletin. Everything should be in the bulletin. Uh, you can follow along if you want to follow along with music. You can also find our hymns in the hymn book as well. Uh, before we jump in and listen to the Word of God filled with His Spirit and His Word and give our prayer and our praise, uh, let's just take an opportunity to greet one another this morning as we've come into the house of God to praise Him. This morning, as we gather in the house of God, let's uh, join with our first hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a very traditional hymn for uh, Reformation Sunday. This is actually Psalm 46, and so uh, as Lutherans have done for centuries, we start our worship by singing uh, a psalm to our Lord, and let's join together in singing A Mighty Fortress, uh, hymn number 684. It's printed out for you in your bulletin.
Let's join together in the response of opening in our worship this morning. Please stand as we join together in singing and speaking the words of the invocation, the confession, and the forgiveness. This morning we begin our worship in praise the same way that we were baptized. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We come before the Lord with certain presuppositions. Humbly, we realize that we are sinners in God's eyes, even in our best attempts. In order to make us worthy to enter his presence, we ask for his mercy and confess our sin. We confess. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And in that confession, let's join together in singing, Lord, have mercy. The good news of the gospel is that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join together in singing Psalm 51, Create in Me. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies and bestow on the church your saving peace. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Join in singing our praise in the words of Psalm 34. be with you. You may be seated. At this time we'll listen to the words of our Lord for this Reformation Sunday. Our first reading is Hebrews chapter 13. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. 
Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourself were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all sexual or sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, for what can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders, who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life, and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, but not by eating ceremonial foods, uh, foods which is of no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister the, at, the ta at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered, out, suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let, let us then go to him outside the, cape, go outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Have confidence in your leaders and to submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this with their work. Oh, do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray so that I may be restored to you soon. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good for doing his will. And maybe, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. For in fact, I have written to you quite briefly. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives, if he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. The word of the Lord. Our gospel lesson is from uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 5 through 11. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it was produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or 30 times what was shown or what was sown whoever has ears let them hear the disciples came to him and asked why do you speak to the people in parables he replied because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you but not to them the word of our lord thanks be to god oh we got lots of room don't worry we'll make room for you you can come up. Yeah, there you go. Lots of room. Good morning, everyone. Oh, man. did you? What, who was here yesterday at the uh, Oktoberfest? Yeah? Okay. Did you guys have a fun time? Yeah? All right. Who's enjoying the weekend so far? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, good to have you here. This is kind of a fun Sunday in, in, in our church. 
So uh, what's October 31st? No, no, it's Reformation Day. No. Okay, so here's the story behind that. I don't know if you guys knew this, but November 1st in the church here is called All Saints Day. And it's a day that typically what Christians would do is they would get together and they would worship and they would remember all of those who have died in faith and are now in heaven. So you'd go to church and you'd thank the Lord for the faith of your grandma and your grandpa if they passed away, or great grandma or grandpa, or anybody that you knew. And so it was always a big day. So on the 31st of October, I know we've kind of turned this into Halloween now, so that it's a little bit different. But on the 31st then, this is what happened. About 500 years ago, a little monk by the name of Martin Luther came and he said, you know, there's a couple of things I think we need to talk about in church because we're not getting this right. And so the night before, he wrote up 95 statements. That was a lot of statements. He liked to write, yeah. And he said, okay, let's talk about these things. And he posted them on the church door. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but we actually have a church door. And on the door are posted those 95 statements. They're in German, though. Can you read them? No, I'm just kidding. They're in English. But we posted them on the door. Now, why do you think Martin Luther, the night before church, put those on the door? Okay, all right. Well, that's a good explanation. He actually, it's the message board, the bulletin board for church. So he put it there the night before so everyone would come in the morning and read it, right? But you're right. You know, what had happened is he didn't want to make something new or different, but he, the gospel message had kind of gotten mucked up. It's like if you put your new shoes in a puddle of mud, you can't see the shining underneath, right? Yeah, so he wanted to talk about that. Yeah. Now here, here and in, in our Hebrews lesson this morning, you guys listen to the sermon, because here's, here's where he really got to the heart of it, right? Uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 5, it says, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So now, what that means is God always sees us, right? Have you seen those little stickers of Jesus by the light switch where it says, I saw that, right? Yeah. Tell me this, raise your hand. Is it is it a little scary that God sees everything you do? Raise your hand if that's scary. Wow! <laughs> yeah, Porter, why is it scary? <laughs> well, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Let me ask this. Remember, God created you. He's seen it all before, right? Yeah. Let me ask this. Are there times when you don't want people to see things that you're doing? Have you ever gotten in trouble before, Porter? Have you ever done something? I'm picking on Porter. Have you ever done something wrong that you didn't get in trouble for? <laughs> yeah. Who saw you? Yes, right? Isn't that a little bit scary that God sees everything, you guys? Whether you hide it from your parents or your teacher or whatever, he sees everything. And that's a little intimidating. He knows all the stuff I do wrong. I'm not going to tell you what I do wrong. But yeah, I do it too. Yeah. So that's how a, a lot of it was coming across in the church saying, okay, this is what God sees. He sees how bad you are. And, and so th on that account, you better do better. Right? And Martin Luther was terrified of God at one point in his life. And then he read a passage about the grace of God and how God not only sees everything we do, but he is always with us. In other words, never will I leave you. Are there times when you guys have been really afraid or something really hard that you have to do or something that you're not sure you can do when you're glad God is with you all the time? Yeah, right? Yeah. And that was the message that Martin Luther brought out. Yes, we know we're sinful in God's eyes, but God loves us so much that he walks with us in everything we do so that we serve him out of love for him, right? So when we read a passage like verse 5, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, that's not scary. That's a comfort, knowing that the Lord has forgiven us that he draws us close and he never leaves us. In fact, he takes us to be with himself. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. This morning, we're going to talk a little bit more about Martin Luther, but especially about Hebrews chapter 13. Listen carefully to what the consuming fire of God is and tell me after church what brings you comfort in the words of Hebrews chapter 13. Can you do that? All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, Thank you for bringing us to church this morning. Uh, I thank you for your grace and your love. May that be our motivation to serve you in all we do. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up, everybody.
This morning we'll continue with the praise of our Lord and our Savior, and we're going to join together in singing Thy Strong Word. You'll find those words, we're going to sing five verses, you'll find those words printed out for you in your bulletin. Uh, you can follow along uh, in, the, in the hymnals if you want to as well, uh, hymn number 630. But we're going to join together in singing Thy Strong Word, uh, the five verses that are printed there in your bulletin.
My family in Christ, happy Reformation Day to you all. Good to see you here this morning. If you're not from a Lutheran background, this may be a little bit of, a, of an unusual Sunday. Uh, we actually, as Lutherans, claimed Halloween about 500 years ago. Yeah. So a, a, little, a little professor at an unknown university put on his costume of a monk. Actually, it wasn't a costume. He really was a monk. And he decided at some point, after reading through scriptures and seeing what they had to say, that there were a few things that were, we were getting wrong in the church. Uh, especially in the area of indulgences. And so he, on the night before a worship service on All Saints Eve on October 31st, wrote down 95 different things that he wanted to discuss among the, the, the clergy in the church, uh, although everybody got to know and to read what he was talking about. And from that point, uh, it, it sparked a powder keg, right? Like, th there were things that were never the same after that Reformation took place. And I'm not saying that only because I'm a Lutheran and I like Martin Luther, but honest to goodness, he struck on a chord that changed very much what we know to be true today in, in, in the world. Yeah, uh, I just listened to a, a podcast somebody had recommended to. It was a secular podcast. It was called The Rest is History. It's two British guys that talk about history. They did a five-part podcast series on Martin Luther, and their, and their declaration was, and they weren't Lutheran or anything else, they said, you know, other than Jesus in the last two years, they, uh, 2,000 years, they felt that Martin Luther was the most influential guy in Western culture. Yeah. Why? Now, you can ask a lot of different people that reason, and everybody's going to give you a different answer. Obviously, I'm a little biased being a Lutheran as to why Martin Luther changed so much in the world, but he struck on something that everybody could connect with and that at some point uh, everybody identified with, yeah. And what the Lord did was he used that man in order to bring about and to cover off the muck that had been put over the gospel of our Lord, yeah. Now, go back even farther to the author of the book of Hebrews. If you've been in church for the last few Sundays, the last 12, as a matter of fact, we've been walking through the book of Hebrews what Martin Luther touched off on was something that, that was not new 500 years ago. But the writer of the Hebrews even identifies it. And, and, what, and what he does uh, before Martin Luther ever showed up was to figure out that in our world in, in which we live, there's really two different viewpoints. Uh, some have called it two different cities. One is the city of God. We heard about that in Hebrews chapter 13 and Hebrews chapter 12. The other is the city of man. <laughs> and, and, and what he touched off was the differences between those two. The city of man or the city of humanity, which is something that can be shaken, that does not have a firm foundation, and the city of God, which is unshakable, as the author puts this morning. So what I want to do is I want to be able to walk through to understand not only why the Reformation was a big deal, we won't dwell a lot on that, but more importantly, as the writer to the Hebrews writes to those who are pressed down, who are beat up, who are looking for uh, grace, peace, and love in their lives, why this makes a difference. How he, we become a part of the city of God as opposed to the city of man, to have the unshakable foundation under our feet no matter what happens. Let, let me share with you, and I'm going to jump back a little bit. Feel free to follow along in your bulletin if you'd like to. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 to 29. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the way that we number our uh, chapters and our verses in the Bible was a man-made thing, not necessarily a, a God thing. And I, I feel that in order to understand all of chapter 13, we have to go back and start with just the conclusion of chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, and then go on with what the Lord says about that unshakable foundation. Let me read this for you this morning, just verse 28 from chapter 12 down through verse 9 of chapter 13. And here... Here's how the author introduces this last chapter of the book of Hebrews. He says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have been shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were mistreated. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept 
impure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you? Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts To be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which is of no benefit to those who do. So far the word of God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, strengthen us in your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. As you first take a look at these verses, especially from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28, I don't know that these are always comforting. Um, He starts out by saying, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Uh, For our God is a consuming fire. Yeah. Have you ever heard a sermon based on that before? And it's usually with a lot of fist pounding. Okay, I know some of you have. Yeah, that's an intimidating thought, right? Yeah, and understand that the idea of coming into the presence of God is truly an intimidating thought. We, we love the Lord. We know who he is. He, we know that he loves us. And yet the presence of God has always been a very scary thing throughout the Bible. In fact, just in the paragraphs before this, the author reminded everybody of that. They said, you know, you remember when you came out of, of Egypt and you were happy, you saw the, you know, the 10 plagues and the part of the sea and it was all great stuff. And then God says, meet me out on Mount Sinai and everybody gathers around. And I'm guessing the Israelites were all super excited to be able to meet God. His presence wouldn't come down on the fire. And then do you remember what happened when his presence did come down? There was thunder and there was lightning and anybody that touched the mountain died and they actually all backed up. They're like, oh, okay, never mind. We don't really want to meet God. In fact, the author, the author gave this little parenthetical statement about Moses in verse 21 on chapter 12. He says, the sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. <laughs> Why? Why is God so scary uh, in order to come into his presence? Yeah. I think maybe in our modern age, we, we miss out on this a little bit because we, we, we miss out exactly on what perfection or righteousness is. I think, and I could be wrong on this, you guys tell me this, but we have a tendency to define righteousness in our own terms. Like we all have an idea of what's right and what's wrong. Uh, you can see it even in the political stuff that comes out on, on what's important and what's not. And I, I think to some degree, we, we do a little bit of comparing. For instance, if, if we're saying that there's two cities that exist in the world. There's the city of humanity, which has been around since the beginning of time, and the city of God, right, that we want to be in. There's these two different mindsets. Now, we all live in a city, right, the city of Mobile, and I don't know that it's always really difficult to uh, assume that we're kind of separate from that and, and to develop our own set of righteousness, right? Imagine if God were to come down to you today and show up in your living room, his presence, I, I mean, what would you say to him? You could probably say, well, God, you know, did you watch the news last night, uh, local news? Uh, I, I promise you, Lord, I have not shot anyone. I have not stolen any cars. I have not wrecked anything. I mean, Lord, if we're really doing a little comparing here, I'm not that bad, right? I, I mean, this is honest. This is what we do. If you watch the nightly news, I'm not saying it's to make you better, feel better, but I, at least we're not on the news. Anybody on the news last night? Okay, I'm just checking to make sure. Could happen, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, sometimes this is, we, we set our own level of righteousness. Now, let me go a little farther, and I'm going to use myself as an example, because I'm not picking on any of you, but just humanity as a whole. This is the kind of city we live in. Tell me, have you ever gone to work before and compared yourself to somebody else, or to school, or family reunions, right? Well, ha, she's a gossip. I mean, I talk about people, but I'm not a gossip, right? I, well, He's a huge flirt. I mean, yes, I have thoughts, but I mean, I'm not like him, right? Or at school, well, yes, he's a cheater. I, not me. I mean, I have looked at papers before, but not, I'm not a cheater, right? And we have this idea of where righteousness is and where everybody else lands, and we make ourselves feel pretty good. Like, if we were to stand in the presence of me, I'm doing pretty good. Pastors do this, too. This is why I'm going to pick on myself, right? We all compare. 
I was just thinking of this the other day with one of our members. I could honestly say, well, we have a Lutheran church. There are no PowerPoint presenters in, he- in here, right? Yes, yes, and I like that, yeah. Yeah, or my brother Tim, as some of you have met him before, he's a great guy, I'm not picking on him, but did you know my brother Tim, who is a pastor in Colorado, does not wear a robe. Yeah, I wear a robe. I even have a stole on, right? We do this comparing, and I, I'm not picking on Tim, but we have this idea of our own righteousness in our own mind, and we live up to our own standard, right? Yeah. But even that's a joke. You know, think about it. Think about what the Lord says even in the golden rule. Love one another, right? As you would like to be loved, so love others. Do we really do that? Again, picking on a pastor. Am I as patient with members of my church as I want you to be patient with me? Uh, You can probably answer that, right? Do I love others really? like I would want to be loved. Traffic is a great example, right? If I accidentally swerve into the other lane because I didn't see someone in my blind spot and they lay on the horn, I'm like, come on, man, leave me alone. But if someone swerved into my lane, how do I react? Right? Even in our own standard of righteousness, I I don't think we live up if we're honest. The difference is nobody knows where the standard of righteousness is in my head because I'm not gonna tell anyone so nobody knows if I'm living up to it or not. This is the scary part of standing in the presence of God. Because it's not our righteousness. It's not what we do. It's not comparing to somebody else. It's not saying I'm better than this. It's not saying, Lord, if you're going to take the top 50% of the people, I think I'm going to get in. It is standing in the presence of God who is holy and perfect in every way so that everything we have done is exposed, right? There is no hiding from the presence of God. Is that a scary thought? Yeah. All right, so... How do you get comfort out of verse 29, right? Understand that a little guy by the name of Martin Luther certainly felt that pressure of, the, of, of God. In fact, Martin Luther, as he stood uh, in front of what he thought was the presence of God, he was going to be a lawyer, and instead he decided to be a monk, much to the chagrin of his father, because he was so terrified of God. And even after he became a monk, he did everything that he could, even beating himself in order to be worthy in God, and he never found it. In the consuming fire of God, he was completely overwhelmed. So how did he draw comfort from a verse like this? Let me read it again. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken... Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And then he goes on and says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Love strangers. Go on and carry out your life. How how is the consuming fire of God comforting? Well, let me ask you this. What else consumes like fire? Justice, anger, perfection is a consuming fire, right? You put gold into a, into, a, into a fire in order to burn out the impurities, right? You know what else burns uh, like a consuming fire? Love, right? Now, let me ask you this, okay? Don't, don't laugh at me for this. Have you ever been so in love, and I'm assuming you all are with your spouses and significant others, have you ever been so in love that it is a consuming fire. In fact, that's all you think about. That's all you do. That's all you live for. You think about the other person instead of yourself, right? You step out of your own role and all you do is think about someone. It becomes a consuming fire. Now, don't think that human beings haven't noticed this. Can you think of any songs that talk about love as a consuming fire? Yeah, you all know Johnny Cash? I fell into a ring of fire and it went down. Yeah, I'm not going to sing it for you, but it's a good bass song. But this is is what we're talking about. It's not just justice or anger, but But love is consuming, right? This is what the Lord is talking about in in verse 29. This is where the Lord is going to. This is what he is saying to us. Because what he is saying is this. Okay, I am a consuming fire, perfect in every way. And I tell you what, if you stand in front of me, you will see where you do not live up to the love of God. But that's only half. Because... The other side of me is a consuming fire of love because I love you in spite of that. This is the love of God. It's not a comparison like, well, you know, Lord, I'm, I'm better than this guy for sure, so hopefully you'll love me, right? It's not consumerism. Well, Lord, I have done this and I have done this. I promise you I will try to be, I'll show up in church on Sunday, Lord. I promise I'll listen to 
54 boring sermons a year. It's not that. That's not why God loves us, right? It's not consumerism. It's not comparison. God loves us because he created us and because we're, he wants to love us. That's it, in spite of who we are. That kind of a consuming love, you know what we call it? We call it grace. <laughs> what changed in Luther's life was that he saw the consuming fire of God both in the justice, but then he learned of God's love in his son, and it completely changed his life. What, what Luther brought into the world, and there was plenty of other things, is that only human beings saw God as a justice God that to be punished, and so we had to earn our way up the ladder. Luther said, that, that's not God. He is a consuming fire that loves us in spite of ourselves and has done something for it. This is what changed the world. And how do we know that? Prove it right? He did. He sent his only begotten son, the one he loved, in order to take our place, to put his justice on him so that we might be loved. That's grace alone that the Lord gives to us in faith alone. And this is the message of scripture alone. Now, how, how does that make a difference? Because what that does is develop a community of grace in which individuals come together that have been changed by the love of God. You see, Martin Luther, it, it wasn't just one man that sparked it off. But what he found was that gospel message and brought it to the forefront, and that created a community of those who come together because of love. This is what Hebrews chapter 13 is about, right? He says, now, because we have been changed by grace, love your brothers and sisters in Christ whether you like him or not. Right? He says, love strangers in your midst, whether they have done something for you or not. Suffer with those who have gone through injustice, not because you have to, but for their sake. Right? Be with those who are in prison. Why? So that you can give them that grace and that love. Practice sexual purity. Why? Because this creates community. When a man and a woman come together and have children, this is what we call community, other words known as a family, right? Don't dwell on your own money as yours, but rather use it for those to whom God has given it to you. For This is the community of grace that Martin Luther was a part of, that we are a part of. And what do we call it? We call it church, right? An imperfect and yet very much grace-filled city of God here on this earth in anticipation of the perfect city of God that will come. Did grace work? I, Martin Luther changed the world in a lot of different ways. Did he change it for us? Well, I promise you this. We would not be sitting here today belting out a mighty fortress is our God if it did not work. And there's God's grace. Right? There's God's love for us. This is what he has done for us that he has drawn us in and given us that love. Let me give you one more illustration. I, the, the, the similarities between the book of Hebrews and Martin Luther's life are rather interesting. Uh, Hebrews was talking to people who were persecuted for their faith. Martin Luther at one point when he said, you know, this is what I believe, uh, the grace of God, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, for we have been saved by grace through faith. And at some point, the leaders at B said, well, that's great, but if you don't take that back, we're going to put it out an edict, and anybody can bring you in dead or alive, right? And, th and that's what, he had, a, he, had a, he had it on his head. Anybody could have taken his, his life. Uh, that was shortly after he had, uh, a couple of years after he had posted the 95 Theses. Do you know how long Luther did live? He was 63 years old. He didn't die then, right? He died later on in life as the Lord walked with him. In fact, on February 18th, 1546, uh, Luther, at this point, 63 years old, uh, returned to the home, his home village where he had been born, and he was preaching there, got violently ill, ended up on his deathbed, as a matter of fact. Uh, he um, screamed out, oh how, I could, how, oh how I suffer, he was in and out of consciousness. Somebody wrote down these as what happened. But at the very end, there was uh, one of his close friends that came up to him, and he said, uh, Reverend Father, do you still hold to Christ and the doctrine that you believe and have preached? And with great effort, Luther said, yes, I do. Right? 
You think about all the things that an individual man had done. He had written 60,000 pages. He had brought home the scriptural truths that you find in scripture, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, by scripture alone. He had stood up to the powers that be at that time, and yet the only thing that mattered at that point in his life is that he was a member in the city of God, right? That the Lord had saved him, and he would soon be home with his Lord and his Savior. Friends, that's our comfort as well, right? The writer says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then gives us this promise of our Savior. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace. Friends, I pray your hearts are strengthened by grace that we may walk with our Lord every step we take. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. This morning as we've come into the house of God, let's confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. You'll find that on page 8 and page 9 of your service folder. Let's join together in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we're going to join together in singing uh, by faith, hymn number 860. You, you will notice in Lutheran worship, it's very participatory. And that's for a real reason. That's so that the people of God may also sing and give their praise and their thanks to our Lord. So, for instance, in our service this morning, we have almost 25 people that have in some way or another participated in the leading of worship. Um, and you'll also notice as we come together and, and do this next piece, it's a choir piece. And what we're going to do is play along with our musicians as well. And we're going to invite the congregation to join in on verse 5. All right? So you also are going to participate and get a chance to sing in the joy of praising our Lord and our Savior. So we're going to join in by faith. And we're going to sing verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 with the choir. And congregation, join us for the fifth verse.
This morning we show our thanks to our Lord by bringing an offering to him. If you brought an offering this morning you don't feel obligated to give, uh, you can place it in the offering plate that is by the entrance of the sanctuary. Our usher will set that back out in the middle so that it's there. Uh, also, if you are a guest or a visitor today, uh, we would appreciate if you just give us a record of your visit. Uh, you can put it on the back of the connection card, which is on the back of the pew, and you could place that in the offering plate as well. And then for anyone that has a prayer request for our prayer of the church today, on the other side of that card is a place to write down any prayer requests that you have. Uh, feel free to place those in the offering plate or hand it to an usher, and they'll get it up to us so that we can include that in our prayer to our Lord today. At this time, then, uh, use this opportunity to go to your Lord in private prayer as our musicians play for us a musical offering to our Lord. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. We have lots to be thankful for. Please stand. We pray. Dear Lord, we have so much to be thankful for on a Sunday like today. We, we know that Sundays come and go, and, and we celebrate what you have done to all the leaders within our faith throughout the years. Uh, we especially remember those who have put their lives on the line that we might know the gospel message. 
And through their efforts, we have known your love for us. Lord, always help us to keep them in our esteem. But also, Lord, know, help us to live according to, uh, to that community of grace that you have put us in. Let us also be the effort to love our brothers and sisters, to reach out to those who are strangers, to take our resources and use them for your gospel message, to keep ourselves in a place that we might be witnesses throughout the world. Lord, today as we remember our church, we remember all of those who have gone before us. We, lay, we pray, Lord, that you would watch over our missionaries, both in distant lands and at home, and fill them with your spirit so they may turn many towards you and the love that you have. We pray, Lord, that you would be with our leaders and our teachers, that we may continue to know the truth of our salvation. We pray, Lord, that you would give each and every one of us courage to live our faith in the truth and purity. Lift us up, Lord, and let us be the salt and the light of the world. Lord, today we also come before you with all of those that need your compassion, who are suffering, that need your blessing, that need your healing hand. We, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to watch over all of those who are dealing with cancer at this time, to Charlie and Heather and Ron. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Carol Watson and Benita as they struggle with different aspects of health. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Leroy, who is in the hospital, and Anna, his wife, and remind them of your love and your grace and your healing power and your wisdom in all things. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Clay as he undergoes surgery tomorrow and help the doctors and the nurses to bring him back to full health. But we especially thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you have given us. We pray that all is done in your name, and we thank you when your will is that we may heal and continue to serve you. You are a good and a gracious God. Finally, Lord, we lift up our praise and our thanks to you. Pull us ever closer to you in your word and closer to one another. Bless us as we go forth with your love and your gospel. In your son's name we pray, amen. Let's join together in praying the words of the Lord's Prayer. You'll find those on page 11 in your service bulletin. Pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And now, brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated. Let's lift our voices and praise one last time to our Lord and our Savior on this Sunday. In the words of the Reformation song, you'll find that printed out for you. Now, just a note... We have been singing the four verses of the Reformation song that has a refrain. And just to make sure that I am, I don't forget, we'll sing verse 1, and then verse 2, and then the refrain, verse 3, and the refrain, verse 4 in the refrain, and verse 5 in the refrain. If you go to the next page, I could not get it all on one page. The fifth verse is our verse that we sing on Reformation Day. So we'll join in singing those five verses of the Reformation song. If you get lost, follow Jennifer's and mine lead and we'll sing it through.
by your power have 